Welcome to a new episode of Walk in Faith. Today is a very special episode. We're actually filming in Annunciation. We're not in the Emmaus Center, but tonight we're actually hosting a night of prayer for Ukraine. And it's an honor to be here with my friend Jason Jones, who we see each other almost every Wednesday on Zoom. Yeah. But Jason is the founder of the Vulnerable People Project, and Jason and his team are responsible for rescuing thousands of people from Ukraine. And he came straight from Poland, but what's so interesting is Montini, Jamie, and I, we were trying to figure out what to do to honor Ukraine, and then Alexis sent a press release. And I said, I knew that God was speaking to me and to say for you to come here. And, and the fact that you came straight from Rome. I mean, you were at the Vatican with yes. the Holy Father, and then you got on the plane, went to Poland and Ukraine, and now you're here. From the bottom of my heart, from all of us in the diocese, it's, a, it's an honor and a blessing for you to be here. I really appreciate it. Well, Craig, I can't thank you enough. It's, a, it's an honor for me, and it's on the bus stop on the way home. I'm, you know, I live in Texas, <laughs> and I said, of course, you know, it's on the way home, and uh, how could I not come and see my dear friend Craig and, and be a part of this beautiful event? For me, it is a great honor and a great privilege and to stand and pray for the people of Ukraine. And I think it's a perfect way to sort of cap. It started in Rome when we were with the Holy Father for the consecration of Russia and of Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And then we went to Poland and the border into Ukraine. And now to be here with you and then end it in prayer. So we started in prayer and we did service and now we're ending in prayer. And of course, I'll probably be going back in the next two weeks and returning uh, to continue the work that we started there. So tell us a little bit about your organization. Now you, you're the founder of multiple organizations and not-for-profits, but tell us a little bit about the Vulnerable People Project. Yeah, it's really one organization, but we sort of keep them, the program separate. The name of the organization is the Human Rights Education and Relief Organization. Our mission is to defend the vulnerable from violence by promoting human dignity and inspiring solidarity. And our two main programs, which we keep separate, the brand separate, is Movie to Movement, which we produce movies and we market films, and then the Vulnerable People Project, which we run aggressive influence campaigns to defend the vulnerable from violence, from the child in the womb to families in Ukraine, to Chinese-occupied East Turkestan with the Uyghur, to the Christians and the Yazidis in Iraq. Our mission is to stand with the vulnerable. I say we do one thing, two ways. We defend the vulnerable from violence by inspiring solidarity and promoting human dignity, and we do that through our two programs. Wow. Tell us a little bit about the, I mean, you just were in Poland. Did you make it from Poland to Ukraine? Or did we you, did, yeah, we, we, did. we got to go and, and to the border of Ukraine and to meet our team. We have a medical team there that we're supporting along with several other teams in Ukraine. And we wanted to meet with our teams up close and personal to thank them for their work and also see what problems that they were facing that we might not have been able to see from back home. Mm. We were actually in Rome and going to Germany to work with Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a big part of our work and more people will probably die this year in Afghanistan than in Ukraine because of famine and because of exposure. And it's a big part of what we do as an organization. So we were in Rome uh, meeting with ambassadors from various countries about resettling Afghan refugees who are in what we call lily pads. They've been evacuated from Afghanistan, but they're maybe in the Emirates or they're in Pakistan and they're in safe houses or they're in, still in hiding. We want to permanently resettle them. So we stopped in Poland, we met with our teams in Ukraine, and we were able to see uh, the beautiful thing, which is the people of Poland have responded to this refugee crisis. It's like nothing I have ever seen. The government is supportive, but it's really just the people of Poland. As refugees come, and they call them families, not refugees, as the families make it to the border, then Polish families will bring them into their own homes. When I was rolling up to the border with my team, I said, you need to be prepared to see chaos and sorrow like you've never seen before in your life which I've experienced in other countries in similar crises. But what we saw instead was something that was very orderly, wow. very clean, and really unbelievable. But that creates a problem. We're seeing Ukraine through the lens of Poland, and Poland is doing, and the EU, other EU countries are doing such a good job with the refugees, that what I'm afraid people are missing is the logistics catastrophe that is happening with the distribution of aid inside of Ukraine. The Russian army is a menace, and it is serious. And so there's a lot of problems distributing food and medicine to the parts of the country that most need it. And so that's something our organization is really committed to trying to partner with large organizations to make sure that together we can solve those problems. And then we were approached by a religious order and said that a lot of young women between the ages of 13 and 19 were put on trains alone to the West. And what's happened is they're being lured by gangs of sex traffickers thinking they're being brought to safety, but then they're being trafficked. And so we've partnered with an organization called Solve Care. It's actually a, a tech medical company that's owned by an American who went there to set up a logistics system to care for his employees' families, and now it's greatly expanded. They had 400 beds for young people, 
um, vulnerable people project, we came in and added another 400 beds, and they said, we need another 1,200. Oh my God. And because this religious order, they have 12 convents, they said, we need in the next week or two, 1,200 more beds and shelters to house young women that are coming from the east so they're not trafficked. And so we're working with this religious order that is going to the places where the traffickers go to find these young women and bring them to the shelters, which then Vulnerable People Project, partnering with Solve Care, will provide. We went there to see really how we as a small Catholic apostolate can plug in to serve the most vulnerable of the vulnerable in this crisis. Oh my God. And you, I mean, I, you know, we know each other personally. So you went from Afghanistan, mm -hmm. right? And then there was, was there any, there was no, there was just an immediate transition to mm -hmm. Ukraine. Well, we added a new team. You know, most of my work still today is Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a catastrophe and there are very few organizations left serving the people of Afghanistan. We're serving those inside Afghanistan. Right now, the Vulnerable People Project is feeding tens of thousands of people, families, getting them through the winter with food and coal. And we can get food almost anywhere in Afghanistan within 24 hours, most places within four. And then we're evacuating those who are in immediate danger. Every week we're bringing out large groups of people that are, are facing death at the hands of the Taliban, that they've been targeted for death. Tell me like what it's like, So, because so, I saw, I don't know if it was EWT and somebody, uh, was it one of the sisters contacted you and you were yes. able to rescue a family? And I've seen pictures that you've mm -hmm. sent. What is it like? So somebody reaches out to you through another organization, and then how do you get that, that family or that person to safety? What is the process like? Well, what happened was, you know, we started out with one person called me on August 13th and said, can you rescue my friend's mother? And I said, okay, I don't know how I could do that. Let me try to figure it out. Because what Vulnerable People Project traditionally does is aggressive influence campaigns, placing op-eds, working with elected officials, uh, through movie to movement, trying to form public opinion through film. So we were, we were drawn into this with one person and we, we tried to set up a system to rescue her. And then we were working with large organizations, the State Department and other groups that were having planes. But it became clear to me that when the United States leaves, these large groups are going to leave. But I never am going to leave. And I, I, everyone who contacted me and at first it was just me, you know, the emails would come in. Because you rescue one person, then 12 emails come in. You rescue 12 people, then 100 emails come in. You rescue 100 people, 1,000 emails come in from people asking for help. And my first words were, you're going to be okay, and I will be with you till you're safe. And we mean that. So we are with them from their very first contact until they are safely resettled in a new country. And so, yes, someone contacts us. We have knit together teams. August, September, and October was pretty messy, finding out who we could trust and who we could work with. But then I shifted gears in October and said, it cost me several thousand dollars to evacuate one person out of the country, but for $250, I can get food and coal to a family so they can survive the winter. So we shifted gears and we said, we're going to focus on distributing food and coal for hundreds of thousands of people through the winter. What that did is it built sort of a sense of reciprocity and trust with us and the people of Afghanistan, especially in the vulnerable communities. So now we can move people much cheaper and it's easier. We have a large networks of support. And if you looked at the size of our organization, you're like, there's no way you're feeding hundreds of thousands of people or evacuating all these people. Well, the truth is we have thousands of Afghan partners. Many of them were former governors or generals and their families. And, they're working with us to evacuate people, to get visas and passports, and to shelter vulnerable minorities. So we've built together a real team serving the vulnerable. I mean, this must take an emotional toll on you. I mean, it has to. 
Well, you witnessed it maybe, right? I mean, I don't know if you witnessed the change with me on those calls, but I, I had tremors. I mean, you um, were physically sick for weeks. I mean, yeah, it was, I mean, the hard part was I never thought I would be me again, to tell you the truth. From August until January, I think that I lost myself. I was very, I wouldn't say depressed, but sort of crushed. And you're working with people who are getting killed. You know, for every person you save, there are people you don't save and you're talking to them, you're looking at their passport photos, you know their children's names. From August 13th till sometime in September, I don't think I slept a minute. My hands would shake, but I had a ritual, which is every night at nine o'clock, I would go to my local grocery store. I would walk around and I would just get a fresh squeezed orange juice and listen to the music and just look at people, just normal people. It was a strange feeling. I remember one time I was doing my ritual, it was nine o'clock at night, we're talking to people that are hiding in addicts, that are starving to death. And in September, we didn't have this ability to get the food to people. But they, imagine if Anne Frank had a cell phone and <laughs> could FaceTime you. And this is what was happening all day, every day. So I'm in Texas, I'm in an H, it's called HEB, I'm in this big Texas grocery store, and I'm in the produce section of all, and my phone rings, and it's a FaceTime call from Afghanistan, from someone that's in a safe house. And I could not answer the phone in the grocery store. I did not want them to see what was around me, and so I run out into the street. I want to answer the call, but I like run out into the parking lot, and I look for the, like a garbage can or something, and I turn, and I, tr I answer the phone, so they see like not this endless aisle of fruit. So it did change me. I remember doing the book club that we're a part of on Wednesdays, and I missed a lot of them, but one Wednesday, I wasn't really participating with you guys. I was working. I just wanted to hear your voices, and it was really comforting just to listen to you guys talk about the book, and I was on my computer working. Yeah, I mean, it takes an emotional toll. One of our Afghan partners literally ended up being hospitalized for a nervous breakdown. And you had a van last week that was destroyed, right? Two weeks ago. Was Two weeks ago was destroyed. In, in Ukraine, it got hit by Russian artillery. It takes an emotional toll on you. You're a family man. I mean, you have, you know, kids, you have a wife. I mean, how do you, are you able to separate it? Do you still, are you able to still give them the time and attention? Like, can you separate? No. No, no, I didn't. And uh, what I did do, though, is I tried to do like new kind of rituals. So I bought a, we don't play chess. We didn't play chess. I ordered a really beautiful ch big chess board with these big, big, beautiful pieces of chess. And I knew I was distant. And I just invite my kids in one at a time every evening and we would play chess, learn chess together. I bought a record player, like an old record player, mm. and I ordered a bunch of vinyl albums. Nice. And I, we would play albums together. I tried to get like the best albums of each decade of the 20th century and we would listen to an album and talk or I play chess moments. and just try to be present and I knew that it took a toll on my wife and it took a toll on my children and it made me really appreciate words and film and articles for influence. I go to dinner parties and schmooze people <laughs> to try to get yeah. policy that defends the vulnerable. That's sort of what we would do there have been those times when I was in Iraq documenting the genocide or when I was in Sudan, but I could say this was harder because I wasn't in Afghanistan. I was in my home and I would be looking at hundreds of passports with children's photos the same ages as my children that their life depended on me. And there's just no way to really begin to understand that. And so this was really challenging. And it's going to continue because your, your work is not done, right? I mean, it is. Oh, but I want to go back to my point, which is it really made me appreciate oncologists, doctors, EMTs, even lawyers. There are people that have these jobs and they have to learn how to go home. They lose a seven-year-old to cancer or something like that. And, and I really I thought about people who did those types of jobs. I said, you know, it's different. And strangely, I don't know what happened, but somewhere around January, I felt that my nervous system sort of caught up to the tasks and I could kind of mentally grapple with what I was doing. What I would tell my staff is, and I told this to the young Afghan man who you met actually, yeah. um, before he had a nervous breakdown. Um, sorry, uh, you met him and uh, I used to tell him, you know, we serve people, we're a donkey, our bodies are donkey and it's how we serve people. I'm like, you can beat that donkey half to death, go ahead, but don't kill it. Yeah, it's, it's hard, but I, I think I've finally been able to, to grapple with it and I've figured it out. I remember two weeks before Ukraine, I said to my wife, I said, I finally got systems and processes in place and it's, it's running itself and my job is to, 
inspire our donors and manage the distribution of funds and do media and I hired people to work directly with the refugees and I hired someone to work on getting visas and it was just like two weeks of peace and then I had to build our team Ukraine <laughs> and it's just like oh no here we go again. I know you lean on your faith but what specific part of your faith do you lean on? Like what do you ask God for or what do you pray to or? I look to the saints and I know that it's the vocation of the Christian and especially as a Catholic, to live in solidarity with the vulnerable. You know, the people that we're serving, I look at them, they're smarter than me, they're better looking than me, they're harder working than me. In Ukraine, they're wealthier than me. They've just been thrust into these positions of incredible vulnerability. They've been thrust into an impossible situation. So I look to the saints. It is uncomfortable serving people that I look at them and I say, they're better than me in every way. I always say the Pieta is a Catholic social apostolate. Our Lady, Immaculate Heart, but a creature, had her Creator lifeless across her lap. And that's us. Like, we're called as Catholics. And I saw that at the border of Ukraine, that the apostles that were really there doing the heavy lifting, they were Catholic apostles. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of Yahoo beautiful souls that found their way there to serve. But the apostolates were Catholic. And that is, I think, as Catholics, our vocation is to stand with those no one will stand with. Think of St. Damien of Molokai, who got leprosy serving the lepers. Maximilian Kolbe, that died in Auschwitz serving the Jews and others. And so we are called uh, to stand with those who are most vulnerable. Our Creator, the second person of the Trinity, became vulnerable so he could become man. This beautiful work of art that we're discussing tonight, when I was asked you know, to give a talk and to reflect, it was from a work of art, that was inspired by the passion, <laughs> I thought, well, this will be easy because I always meditate on the passion. I always meditate at the scourging of the pillar. I always think about the pieta. But then when I saw what the work of art was, I was like, you pulled a fast one on me. <laughs> it's the resurrection. But I was like so grateful for that because what is the meaning of the crucifixion without the resurrection? But I suffer, I'm writing a book right now, my, my spiritual autobiography for Sophia Press. I say in the book, I suffer from the sin of presumption, you know? We struggle with that in our age. Like, we all think we're going to heaven, and, um, but we know we need to work this out with fear and trembling. But the resurrection is what gives meaning to the crucifixion. The people we're serving are meant to live in eternity with God. Violence is the gravest scandal. Think about that. War is scandalous. Nietzsche, Sartre, Camus, the existentialists, the nihilists, they are created by war, by chaos, by violence. Nihilism is an ideology. Nihilistic eras, they're the fruit of violence. That's the scandal. Scandal's stumbling block. But then when we show up as Christians and we show love in the midst of all this chaos and violence, we turn the stumbling block, the scandal, into a stepping stone. And that's what I want. I thank God for the grace that he gave me because I will say this, when I look at people, I see the image of God. I see God in the mirror. I see them. You know, C.S. Lewis says we must have a veil in front of our eyes because the truth is we would drop in awe at every human being we saw. But I think by God, I do see people like this. And when I go to the border and I see the refugees, I see the most beautiful creature in the cosmos. There's a Bulgarian saying about, you can tell the breed of a horse even if it's hauling trash. And you can tell a human being is made in the image of God even in the midst of the greatest horrors. And so that's where we come in as Christians, right? We come in, in the midst of these horrors, to remind people of their destiny, of their resurrection, of their eternal life, of peace, of love, of joy. That's what motivates me. That's why I want to go there, because the idea that these creatures made in the image of God are despairing, and that that despair and that that scandal can lead to eternal separation from God, that is what drives me. So I'm so grateful that tonight, that we're not looking at the Pieta, we're not thinking of the scourging at the pillar. We're looking at the resurrection, and that's exactly what we need in this age. I really I appreciate you coming, and you know we advise everyone to support you, the Vulnerable People Project. I'll see you again tomorrow on, on Zoom, yeah, and we we'll look forward to tonight and, and yes, hearing sir. you speak. God bless you, my brother. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. You. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Walk in Faith. Always remember, you have the ability to inspire and evangelize through words and actions. God bless you.